as our family was growing up, our children reached the age of entering the university. And our daughter was, of course, the oldest and the first to leave and go to college and enrolled in Bob Jones University. And we made a trip from our home in Phoenix to take Laurie to school. And we took Lewis along with us and made it a vacation. Uh, we planned it so that we would go through Washington, D.C. on our way to North Carolina, or South Carolina. And we had opportunity to do some sightseeing in the capital city. We went to the National Museum and they were displaying the Hope Diamond at that particular time. And you hear a lot about it, or at least I had often known through my life. And it's beauty, it's enchanting colors. And I thought, oh yeah, sure, yeah, big deal, you know. But then I saw it. And I'm here to tell you it's beautiful. It is gorgeous. You just, you keep looking at it and you look at it from this design and that side. And it's just brilliant and beautiful. Now suppose somebody gave that diamond to you to take home. It's yours. We're going to let you have it for a month. <coughs> In your home. <coughs> Excuse me. My question is, how would you treat it? Just put it out in the tool shed. Back porch. And we have a nice table out there on the back porch. Let's put it out there on the back porch. It'll be fine. <clears throat> Would you give it any tender love and care and protection and I dare say in most cases, not in all, but in most cases, many cases, a person, a family would go to greater detail and care and concern and whatever to take care of that diamond than they would their child. The child is a never, never, never dying soul. That ought to grip people, parents, moms, dads, with the fear of God. think that that child, more than likely of God grants, will grow up to be a teenager, a young person, an adult, and, and die. By way of interest, John Owen and his wife had ten children and outlived them all. including only one who became an adult, a daughter at the age of 35. The reality, time and time again, of gripping you that death has taken this child 
but the soul lives forever in heaven or hell. God is overseeing and determining the work that may take place to bring that child to himself. But in the meantime, parents have an obligation to provide the best possible environment in that home and the discipline and the training to, that will encourage that child and bring the best out of that child rather than the beast. Because as you bring out the beast in that child, you are handicapping them to be in that situation where God will be pleased to do his work of grace. He can do it anywhere, anytime. But we need to be sure that we're not part of the problem. So, Pastor, you're spending a lot of time on child training. Yes, I am. I know. I have reasons for doing so. I realize I'm very much aware that this is not the highest on your interest list for, for a lot of people. A good number of people that might be here or might not be here. I, I understand that. I also understand that these messages go out and they are listened to by many, many other people besides us. But also I'm saying that if you are alert and aware, you're picking up strands of and truths that are theologically and doctrinally true, whether they have to do with children or not. So there's truth to be gleaned. Maybe you don't go home to your two-year-old, but you go home realizing God is a God that is concerned about the family, concerned about the little ones, and did not the little ones to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, may God help us to learn what he wants us to learn, whether we have children or grandchildren or no children or God's truths are eternal. May God help us. What about future relationships? <clears throat> We're going to enter into several different phases. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> today we will be considering future relationships. I want us to if you will, <clears throat> open your Bible to first, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter six. Beginning with verse 14, we have specific instruction regarding marriage. Do not be bound together with unbelievers, or what partnership have righteousness with law and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst, and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord 
Almanya. Now, actually, verse 15 through 18 are a commentary on verse 14. And verse 14 says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. Dear people, God means what he says. What does this mean? It means that a true child of God ought not to marry an unbeliever. And that's what it means. It also would include any other type of personal uh, or rather permanent relationship such as partners in business. Here's the key point. Here is where parents need to make certain restrictions. If, here's the question, if you know that God forbids it, why would parents allow things that would encourage it? Here's a very, very subtle lie of Satan. If your child associates with, parenthesis, dates, this unsaved person, maybe they'll come to know Christ. And I have only one word to say about that. The purpose of dating is not evangelism. And there are other areas as the child grows, where parents will need to make certain restrictions. It's not a free-for-all and anything goes, whatever you want, honey. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Or do you not know your body? That's right, the word is body. Is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body. I'm appalled at some of the clothing that is worn in our day that leaves absolutely nothing to the imagination. And you can see it in Walmart as you go shopping. And I don't mean on the clothing rack. What are these verses talking about? 
They're talking about glorifying God. Let me repeat that. They are talking about glorifying God. in your body. How often do we think, how often do people ever cross their minds I'm to glorify God in this body? Believers are to glorify God in their bodies because their physical body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. What would you think? If I came in here and had lunch on the front row, and left my carry-ins with food remnants. Laying here on the front row of the church. What would you think if I, walking out, left my trash bag laying up here on the communion table? Says, it's just not right, Pastor. It's the church. We ought to have more respect for the church than to leave garbage laying on the front row and putting my feet up on the top of the chairs in the next row. Don't you have any respect for the church? What's wrong with you? says that our body is to glorify God. How wonderful. How wonderful it would be to see children trained in such a way that the moment that they are saved, as God would be pleased, to save them, they would be very, very much aware my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. They would know that. They would understand that. <clears throat> and that they have a responsibility of glorifying God in that body. You see, if a child is going to be trained that way, it's going to be very incumbent upon you to train your child in some very practical things that may draw criticism from some people. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. First Timothy 2 verse 9. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments but rather by means of good works, as befits women making a claim to godliness. Some of the statements in this verse are, are relative. They grow out of the original statement, 
the relative statements are related to time, the original statement is related to principle. I'm going to run that by you again because it's very important to understand what I'm saying in order to understand what we're teaching. I'm saying some of the statements in this verse I'm saying are relative. They grow out of an original statement. The relative statements are related to time. The original statement is related to principle. There's an enduring, ongoing principle that's there. And what is that principle? The principle is that women should dress modestly. I'll have some things later on to say about men. But this right now is confronting us, particularly with women. Now let me make a statement. It sounds, it's not all that profound, but it may be more profound than you realize. The little girls of today will be the women of tomorrow. God says, God says that he expects Christian women to dress modestly. What do we mean by the word modest? You don't hear that word a lot in our day. Now, there is a common ordinary meaning that can put us in a position of limiting one's self to a particular point of time in history. And instead of presenting a modest testimony, you end up presenting a peculiar testimony. Now, for example, there are those amongst our population, not as many as there used to be, but I think there are still some identifiable people and groups who believe that modesty means sleeves down to the wrist and skirts down to the ankles. There was a time when that was considered to be modest apparel. People dressed that way. I've shown a picture of my high school and I happened to be in the middle of a hallway when a picture was taken for the yearbook and I happened to be standing by next to a girl that I was interested in <laughs> and maybe this will kind of interest you a little bit maybe. Back then the way you, one way you expressed you, you had some interest in a girl was to offer to carry her books to the next class. That's just kind of one of the ways that was popular in those days. So here I am, and here's this girl. And you can see several other guys, and two or three other girls. And um, literally, the skirt is down to the, almost to the ankle. And um, the guys dressed in ROTC uniforms with a tie at Woodrow Wilson High School. 
and that was the way people dressed. And it was considered to be modest, and it was. The word modest comes from a Greek word. And that Greek word means orderly arrangement. Let women adorn themselves in a manner that is orderly. There's the principle. Now, follow closely. There are some professed Christian parents who do not believe that their daughters should ever wear shorts or slacks. And their thought is that that's modest. Well, I want to say this very politely and very graciously. That is adhering to a period of time rather than to a principle. But keep in mind the principle. Let me repeat it. There is an orderly arrangement for apparel. There are times when shorts or slacks would be more modest than a dress. Appropriate. We should be aware of the importance of wearing clothing that is appropriate. Pajamas are perfectly appropriate for the bedroom, but totally inappropriate for doing business at the bank. Shorts are appropriate in appropriate places and at certain times. So when we think of modest apparel, let us think of it as orderly arrangement. Daughters should be taught and including your son. From the very beginning, that there is an appropriate use of clothing. And that helps to begin to stop something before it gets started. I'm going to put a parenthesis here. It has become popular in some of our mega churches for the pastor to go to the pulpit in his torn blue jeans, white t shirt, and flip flops. And I'm here to say that is totally inappropriate and it is not glorifying God. In parentheses. Parental training here, if you start out at the beginning, you begin to help them to develop habits that they will have acquired to the extent that it will be helpful to them as they enter into other age brackets of life. It starts here. You don't wait until it gets up here and then all of a sudden slam them with it. No, no, no. Careful training. 
while it's training here, and it grows with it. That doesn't, I'm not saying that in those early days that it might not be somewhat problematic, maybe some despairing. But what about brushing your teeth? Was that never a problem? Were you willing to put up with it and patiently, time and time again, to make sure that those teeth got brushed? You see, there really is a time when a habit is acquired where it becomes a part of you. What does all of this have to say about in relation to training a child according to his bent? because that's our theme. I'm convinced that the matter of Christian testimony falls down as much in this area as much as any other area. If we have a glowing Christian testimony, it can be made even more attractive if we are tidy about our persons. And if our parents is everything that it ought to be. It's all part of life. And it requires patience. Requires diligence. It requires training with a goal in mind of the person you want your child to be like. In terms of appearance, in terms of habits of life, I don't know whether this, this is an old time word. You, you want them to be polished. Right? But it doesn't come naturally. It comes because of diligence. And you know what? I want you to understand this, dear people. That is ultimately a product of love. It's saying, I want what is best for my child whether it's his personal habits or whether it's his appearance in public. I want it to be the best. Is it worth effort? Discipline? Consistency? Day after day after day We live in a world that is dominated by fashion. The latest fashion, the latest whatever. Gotta have it. And then something else comes out. Gotta have it. Follow the money, people. <laughs> it's a business. People are buying into it unnecessarily. Now, I don't mean your kid has to go to school barefooted. But I mean there's propriety in one's dress and appearance. And you know something? I'm going to end with this. I'm not sure how 
worded exactly. But what I want to say is this. In many, in many ways, not to the nth degree, but in many ways, the way you dress affects the way you behave. You can think about that. In the meantime, dear people, let us realize we have something in our home infinitely more worth more than the Hope Diamond. It's a never dying soul. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you use this time to help us realize what a great responsibility we have and even perhaps reflect on those words of our Lord let the children come to me and sometimes Lord many of the ways that we're treating our children is keeping them away let's look to you today Lord for your help your guidance your direction in Christ's name we pray. Amen.